All right, so um, welcome to the first session of A Tale of Two Cities. Um, there are some folks who may be joining us uh, via Alumni Week at, at UC Santa Cruz. And thank you very much for, for popping in and, and checking out what we do. So um, the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club, also named the, the Santa Cruz Dickens Fellowship, um, is a community of, of readers who um, have been reading 19th century literature together for the last uh, three or four years. Um, our program is now uh, virtual. And so we tend to read about uh, two novels each year um, spread out over uh, I think about 10 months. We take the summers off and we take December off, but otherwise we meet on the fourth Sunday of the month. So um, as I mentioned, this is the first meeting of A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, um, this is the first of three. The discussions will be led by Wayne Batten, who is the, the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club president. And um, he's been serving on the board of the Friends of the Dickens Project for many years. So we're really excited to have him. Um, so Wayne has his PhD from Vanderbilt. And after a two year postdoc appointment at Vanderbilt. Um, he then went on to teach at Montgomery Bell Academy, which is an all boys preparatory school in Nashville. So he taught there for 30 years. And um, he taught a tale of two cities for 30 years there. Um, he's currently um, so after his retirement and in 2015, he's been researching and writing full time, uh, largely in 19th century literature. Um, and he's published about a half a dozen articles in scholarly journals, um, including one article on Charles Dickens. So Wayne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for that great introduction. And see, Donna, you mentioned starting a seminar with a question. So do you have a starting question for us? I don't, I have some observations, but I, uh... oh, okay, here's one. I've come up with some answers to it, but um, whereas the book was originally titled Recalled to Life, yes, who or what has been recalled to life so far in this book? Well, of course, the first answer that comes to mind is, of course, Dr. Manette, who's recalled and freed from the Bastille in the beginning. But then it's a theme throughout the novel. Ultimately, the ugly no path spoilers. of... <laughs> the St. Eremon brothers is recalled to life. And oh, I'm sorry, ultimately what of the St. Eremon? Oh, the past? Yeah, the past uh, yeah. and why Dr. Manette was in prison is recalled to life. But that doesn't happen until our third section, but... Uh, How about the, all the headlines? That's, there's all these news headlines. Dickens went into the, the morgue of the library and brought out all these headlines in the first chapter. I thought that was pretty cool. Yes, yes. <laughs> Although a lot of it is what we would now call fake news, like the Cock oh, Lane ghost. But, oh, the Cock Lane, yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. People would go to hear the ghost rap on the walls, including <laughs> uh, Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson. But it turned out to be, if I remember rightly, the in innkeeper's daughter who was uh -huh. concealed and she would rap on the walls. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the prophecies and predictions are based on news of 1775. But then, of course, the narrator points out the real news was the Continental Congress in the colonies 
which would ultimately mean that Britain lost the colonies. <laughs> no one was paying much attention. Well, I would like to begin with an anecdote in 2004, the universe uh, focused on a tale of two cities. And it so happened that at breakfast, I saw two Asian people uh, sitting alone. So I thought, well, yes, I'll join them. It was wonderful. Turned out they were a Chinese couple and they were working on a new translation of A Tale of Two Cities into Chinese. But they went on and explained that particularly the British run schools had taught The Tale of Two Cities as a way of teaching English for decades. And they, both of them had no doubt that the reading of A Tale of Two Cities had influenced the revolutionary sentiment, which resulted in the overthrow of the emperor, if I'm correct, in uh, 2000, not 2000, yeah, 1911, sorry, 1911. So <clears throat> I guess since the 1980s, there's been a reluctance among literary people to draw any connections between fiction and reality. But uh, these translators were quite sure there was a direct connection between, uh, between fiction and reality. The second introductory material has to do with the most famous opening line probably in literature over which Dickens struggled. He wrote to John Forster, his friend and later biographer, that he was having great trouble getting started. But now, of course, if you try to research A Tale of Two Cities, you have to put in more into your, your search tags or you will get all kinds of stuff with A Tale of Two Cities in the title or abstract or something. So I was thinking I, I, it might be too personal to ask you when you've used that phrase, but I don't think I'll offend anybody if I say that I used it quite sincerely to characterize my experience at graduate school in the 1970s and early 80s. <laughs> But it's a phrase that I think many people use and have no idea that it comes from A Tale of Two Cities or even Dickens. So remarkably, his opening here is, has transform, been trans transformed into a cliche. <laughs> so I do have a question. Can you think of any other literary phrase, including say Shakespeare or other plays, that has gained the, oh, the common usage of the best of times, the worst of times. <laughs> to be or not to be. I'm sorry? To be or not to be. That's good, yes. From uh, Hamlet's it's soliloquy, I believe. And the beginning, the beginning of Pride and Prejudice. I can't remember the exact wording just now, but that oh, one is yeah. really quoted. Is the truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a fortune must be in want of a wife? <laughs> and Wayne, I think I used the expression. It was the best of times. The word. Well, I was going through my divorce. Oh my goodness! Oh. <laughs> and um, I think. Wow. I, I, I studied Latin for three years, so I often use carpe diem or alia octa est, which. Yeah, where are they from? Uh, Caesar, well, Caesar said alia octa est as he was crossing 
the the Tiber River, I believe. And um, I'm not sure Carpe Diem, probably some, you know, something in the um, the myths that we studied or what Caesar might have said. It was from Horace. Horace said Carpe oh. Diem. Okay. And Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Oh, Rubicon. Sorry. Wrong. wrong oh, no, <laughs> Well, what does Aliaka Est mean? The die is cast, meaning we oh, can't yes. go back. We can't go back. It's it's yes. out. Wayne? Sure. Um, uh, I wanted to point out some of the places uh, where we see Dickens' um, um, A Tale of Two Cities. Um, it's everywhere in politics. Um, I occasionally uh, write about um, Dickens' works in, in the public sphere for GLAD, and um, it's just constant with politicians using the word Dickensian, oh, that was Dickensian, or, um, uh, but um, they refer to, well, that's, here's a tale of two cities, you know, when two country, uh, two cities are fighting or whatever, and um, um, it's also used in travel, and I notice a, like Road Scholar and a lot of different travel groups, they'll advertise their, their, their travel at Tale of Two Cities. And um, <laughs> sometimes it's um, London and Paris, and sometimes it's other cities. So, I mean, it's, I mean, he has just remained in the sphere, our sphere, for all these de decades. That's great. I have to say that the events of January 6th, 2021, am I right? The storming yeah. of the US Capitol mm -hmm. recalls Dickens' description of the storming of the Bastille, mm -hmm. right down to apparently some uh, guardsmen inside open the doors to the cr crowd that may be disputed but uh, yeah. for, forgotten who said that history doesn't exactly repeat itself. It parodies itself. <laughs> well, that gives us the two cities of um, Disneyland and whatever the capital of Florida right. is. Yes. Well, that's Disney World is in Florida. Orlando. Disney World is different? OK. Yeah, Disney World is in Florida. <laughs> All right. Well, well it's very different Disney from Disneyland. World in Miami or Tallahassee. Or oh, Orlando. it's in Orlando. It's in Orlando. I know, but there's another city involved with it. Yeah, but no, the, we're supposed to be a joke. It wasn't very good. Well, I personally use uh, for my own things. I use the line from Shakespeare: "First, let's kill all the lawyers." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and uh, yeah, I, I have. I used to have that that quote up at work, and I would judge people's intelligence on whether or not they knew what it was. <laughs> I'm sure it I would have impressed you as uh, I'm not sure. I was going to say, Wayne. I um, hi. lately. Hi, Wayne. Hi. <laughs> I was. Um, in a move of irony, I've been using a lot more in the last few years. Now what I want is facts. So the beginning of hard times has really, um, that line has resonated <laughs> with me more in the last few years than, than in a long time. I have to admit, sorry, can't hear you. Thomas? I think you're muted. Now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, all happy families are alike. Every unhappy yes. family <laughs> is unhappy in its own way. Yeah, Anna Karenina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, I wanted to go a little bit into the publishing history, although most of you probably all know it. 
in 1857, Dickens, who loved amateur productions, loved theater, took the part, if I remember rightly, of Richard Warder in The Frozen Deep, a melodrama by Wilkie Collins. And he was, as he says in his preface, he was entranced by playing that role, in which a man tries to save the life of his rival for the hand of a woman. It so happened for that production, some professional actors were hired, one of whom was Ellen Turnan. Now I, I discovered or realized early along in teaching where I taught, the boys would not be interested at all in Ellen Turnan. In part because numbers of their fathers had in fact taken trophy wives. <laughs> so to avoid stepping on feelings, I and it's just it's just not a thing that really interests young boys. But then in 1858, he, of course, separated from his wife. I think he started up by having the connecting door between their bedrooms sealed up. <laughs> like she's going to break it down or something, I guess, you know, so. <laughs> and at this time, he felt the publishers of Household Words which he edited, had not been supportive of him during this separation. And he managed to buy out their interest in household words and begin all the year round, a new periodical. To really in, ensure its success, he decided to serialize a novel in this new well, not periodical, a newspaper, it was a weekly. I think it cost two pence. So it became extremely popular. Within a short time, it was selling $100,000 an issue, not, not $100,000, 100,000 subscribers per issue, which in 1859, when it started coming out, was a lot of readers to, to get. The newspaper publication did not include the illustrations. Simultaneously, Dickens published the novel in the familiar uh, monthly format, 32 pages each, approximately. And with these, there were the illustrations by Fizz which I think have been pretty severely underrated. So I want to spend some time later on, later on, on some of Viz's illustrations. Yes. One last thing I used as a teaching tool, the best of times, the worst of times, is the first in a series of parallel clauses that don't end until the first paragraph ends. The first paragraph ends with a period, the first one that you see. And so I used to comment that someone picking this up at an, a newsstand or a book stall would start reading that first paragraph with all its antitheses. And because we're trained only to stop when we see a period, that there's likely the whoever was reading it would be hooked after reading that first full paragraph. <laughs> Maybe a cheap trick, but effective. Okay, I wanted to try to follow John Jordan's lead and divide up the reading into parts. And in this case, it was fairly simple. So the first part 
could be labeled Dover. That is the trip to Dover, the meeting of Lori and uh, Jarvis Lori and Lucy Manette. The second part is Saint Antoine, which of course is part of Paris, and the reunion of Lucy and Dr. Manette. I just want to make a comment. In Paris, I was eager to see Saint Antoine. And what do I find? It's now a very posh shopping district. district. <laughs> Nothing like Dickens describes. The third part I would call London because there we move back and see Darnie on trial and the meeting with Carton and the assembly of most of the major characters at the end of chapter five. So this first reading takes us to the two cities, Paris, and then to London. Maybe that's a cheap trick, I don't know, but. <laughs> I guess we could see the first slide, Courtney. Thank you. This is a well-known cartoon. I'm not sure it's 1789, but it's pre-revolution. And the French phrase reads something like, one should hope that the game will end soon. <laughs> And you can see the clergyman representative of the first estate is just in front of the aristocrat looking fairly ridiculous, who represents the second estate, the aristocracy. And then of course, they're riding on the back of the peasant who represents the third estate or everybody else. The third estate, of course, bore the brunt of fees and toxic, uh, taxes in the old regime. I'm not sure why the aristocrat is a little ragged. Oh, it's because the, the king was riding them hard for a generation or so. Yes, yes. Yes, they were not all rich by any means. I don't want to skip ahead too much, but one thing I always explain to my classes uh, about the saint Evremont estate and why the Marquis so distrusts Darnie if I'm not mistaken, France did not follow the custom of uh, primogeniture genitor as England did. So estates could be divided up among all the sons. I don't think they counted any daughters, but that man means that the principal source of income would be slid up, split up routinely. So Charles, through his father, might claim half of the saint Evremont estate. Now, I'm not an expert on legal history, but I think Dickens knew that and didn't want to bore the reader with an elaborate explanation. But Charles, could really represent a financial threat to his uncle surviving. Home. And that kind of gets me to the idea of 
absorbed or reflective history. <clears throat> By that, I mean that in A Tale of Two Cities, we get history, but to some extent it's fictionalized or implied. Dickens did not want to load his novel with footnotes or make his reader feel stupid or ignorant. But for an example, chapter two, the Dover Mail. The Dover Mail describes the horrible condition of roads in England and the great difficulty of traveling. The situation was probably worse in France. So that the hunger that Dickens describes later on was caused by a shortage. There had been a couple of bad harvests and I think two years of inflation, which effectively reduced wages for the third estate. But the great, the problem was exacerbated by terrible distribution system. So we've seen that with COVID, with these, those barges that can't be unloaded. <laughs> but that apparently was happening in France by 1789. And there'll, there are more examples of that, of course, a direct description of some historic events like the September massacre is based on fact. Okay, I want to look a little more at the description of law and order in the first, first paragraph. If you remember one is the description of the grisly execution of a French youth for failing to kneel to a procession of dirty priests. And this, again, was based on fact. In one attempt to carry out this kind of execution, there is a point near the end where horses are attached to the prisoner's ankles and wrists and the, the horses are supposed to pull him apart, you can imagine. But in at least one execution, the horses kept slipping on the blood. <laughs> and apparently the prisoner had to be dismembered by the old fashioned means. In the, the second description, of capital punishment, the narrator describes the crimes that could be punished by execution in England, but the tradition did not mean that the roads were any safer or the houses any more secure. So if we could go back to the first slide for just a minute, sorry. Yeah. I have there a dose of Foucault because I can't resist. He's a French philosopher, of course, who died, if I remember rightly, in about 1985. But Foucault was fascinated by the forms that power takes. And two major kinds of power sovereign power and disciplinary power. Sovereign power exerts itself from the top down. In France, it would be the king. Maybe in England, the combination of parliament and the judiciary. But it, it relies on punishment, the threat of punishment, intimidation, and unnecessary coercion. And we see that described here in chapter one in both France and England. 
but the other type of power is disciplinary. And this is not what you would think. It's power exercised by people, let's say within the same group or network, horizontal, I, I think of it as horizontal, it relies on cooperation. Uh, both, both types need the complicity of the ruled. And I just throw in the social contract. Uh, can anyone define the social contract? Which for me in Rousseau is somewhat confusing. Well, if I remember correctly, um, in the social contract, people uh, cede a measure of power in return for certain benefits that they get by having a cohesive society. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it, they, um, it, they concede, they cede it to the, what's, what he called the general will. And I think that's pretty, that's important for the portrait of the Jacquerie and the Jacques and in, in the Saint Antoine portions of the novel and the, the way that Dufarge's influence ramifies throughout Saint Antoine. Mm -hmm. Yes. General will. Wait, run that by me again. Um, Rousseau said that um, the, the social contract was the formation of the general will by the individuals who enter into it, um, who um, in, in a somewhat mystical way <clears throat> create uh, the democratic expression of the people's wishes and the, the way the Jacques work together and the way the network, the secret network spreads through France. Um, and, but becomes overt and active when the revolution, when the revolution starts. Um, Dickens portrays that in some ways as a Rousseauian uh, general. The mob, it, it, the mob is his version of Rousseau. Thanks. And that's why I think chapter one is important because the sovereign power is not working too well. But then when we get to the mob scenes, it turns out that the disciplinary power can go astray. Let's see. I thought we could move to an illustration. Uh, second slide, Courtney. There it is. This is the reunion of Lucy and Dr. Manette with uh, Jarvis Lorry back there in the background and Ernest Defarge looking on. Fizz is very accurate in describing the shaft of light that comes through the open doorway. But I'm curious as to the kind of halo be, behind Dr. Manette. Now, one of my students would probably say, well, obviously Madame Defarge has followed up the stairway with the flashlight and she's shining it on Dr. Manette. And just to be mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I think it's a brilliant illustration precisely because Ernest Defarge is standing just outside of the light. What? I okay. Are you opening that up? I um, yes, yes. I I think that um, just as um, when they when they leave Defarge's place, um, Dickens is talking about. Um, uh, well, planets sharing their light. And um, I think he gets into uh, people being um, mysterious to one another. Yes. Um, I, I, I put that together with Defarge saying, hey, if you open the door, he'll go nuts. Well, um, 
if you opened the door to anybody's mind, anybody's inner sanctum, they probably wouldn't put up with that too long before they did go nuts because, you know, we're not used to that in, in this, in, in the city of man, we're used to having boundaries between people uh, so that we don't, you know, witness against ourselves and, and one another, um, you know, it's like, <sighs> I think there's something in the Bible. Men preferred the darkness, uh, lest the light should find their wickedness or something like that. So I think here, um, uh, Manette is opened up to meet his visitors. Uh, and Lucy symbolizes light and, and she kind of opens him up. Um, but he's still, a, I mean, light's shining on him. I, I don't think light's shining from him. I don't think he's completely opened up. And I don't understand why Defarge, I, and I never noticed that Defarge was standing outside the light, but I I did notice that he was kind of dressed with his jacket slung over him like that. Uh, he, he reminded me of Pontius Pilate. I, I don't know if, if what I've said is, is uh, at all cohesive, so maybe I'll step back and maybe you can say what I said better than I said it. No, I think what you said is excellent. Absolutely right on. Uh, Defarge had been a servant to Dr. Manette. That's the connection and probably why Matt Manette has been taken in by Defarge upon his release. But as we know later in the novel, Defarge, Defarge uh, Ernest plays kind of a nefarious part in later events against his own conscience. But uh, yes, I like what you said about opening up. Just in terms of the illustration, I love the way Lucy's dress provides a balancing spot of light there. So we have a perfect triangle of light. And to pick up on what you said, I wanted to read the first paragraph, or maybe someone would read it for me. The first paragraph of book one, chapter three. Anyone volunteer? <laughs> I have the book right here, um, book one, chapter three. Yes, The Night Shadows. The Night Shadows. Can I ask the reader to turn on the video so we can see you reading? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, where am I? I don't see me. Okay, The Night Shadows. A wonderful fact to reflect upon that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. A solemn consideration when I enter a great city by night that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret, that every room in every one of them encloses its own secret, that every beating heart in the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is in some of its imaginings a secret to the heart nearest it. Something of the awfulness, even of death itself, is referable to this. Uh, is, is that the portion you want or should I go on? Oh, please go on. Okay. Um, no more can I turn the leaves of this dear book that I loved and vainly hope in time to read it all. No more can I look into the depth of this unfathomable water wherein as momentary lights glanced into it, I have had glimpses of buried treasure and other things submerged. It was appointed that the book should be shut with a spring forever and ever, uh, sorry, forever and forever. When I had read but a page, it was appointed that the water should be locked in an eternal frost when the light was playing on its surface and I stood in ignorance on the shore. My friend is dead, my neighbor is dead, my love, the darling of my soul is dead. It is the in inexorable consolidation and perpetuation of the secret 
that was always in that individuality and which I shall carry in mind to my life's end in any of the burial places of this city through which I pass. Is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their innermost personality to me or than I am to them? Well, thank you so much. That was great. At least one critic has remarked that this passage just pops out as modern, profoundly, absolutely modern. And it's rather stuck in here mm. when we're still trying to get Jarvis Lorry to, to Dover. And we're not sure who the narrator is talking about when he says my love is dead, or he, if he isn't just pulling the emotional stops here, get as much as he can. But anyone want to weigh in on why here, Charles Dickens, did you really need filler this badly? It's beautifully written, I think. <laughs> but why here? It just About inspires their seven million stories in the naked city. Yeah. That's what I think perfect. of every time I read that. Well, for another for for another thing that the the wine barrel has has burst, you know, uh it's no longer bounded, so now it can be functional and shared. Right. Right. But there's so many secrets and you never do know anybody's secrets. You know, you can't see into the mind of Dr. Manette. You cannot, you cannot see the Saint Evremont uh, secret. Um, I think we're all secret from each other, no matter how well we know each other, you know. That's true. But Dickens does sometimes uh, shift into the character's mind in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, first with Jerry Cruncher and then Jarvis in the carriage. And then during the trial of the first trial of Charles Darnay, we're getting much of Cruncher's point of view, which explains its somewhat fragmentary, confusing quality. I know that when students get to that part, they found it really hard going because Dickens in his own style is imitating the way Jeremy Cruncher observes things, thinks about things. But no, I think you're right. The the passage illustrates, to use the 20th century word, alienation. That we may live in a large city, but we're still unknown to the people next to us, or even close to us. Wayne? Yes. It's possible, too, that having begun his relationship with Ellen Turnham, <laughs> that he is harboring his own secret and um, brooding about that. <laughs> yes, yes. This is his superego talking. <laughs> I have to add an anecdote. In one of his letters, I picked up a comment Dickens made about this time that his help me was getting fatter and fatter. And uh, I don't know, but I, I suspect that unlike many men in this period, he did not like fat woman, women. And poor Catherine had put on a lot of weight. So <laughs> that's just a surmise that I've made anyway. Yes. Well, perhaps that had something to do with the 12 pregnancies. I think so, yes, poor woman. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, when Queen Victoria died, she had helped me at least 10 children. Mm -hmm. But it was discovered that she had a prolapsed uterus. The poor thing must have lived with that for years. But <laughs> did, yes. Did she, get, did she get surgery? I never heard of that. I don't think so, no. Uh, it, it was discovered when they performed an autopsy on Victoria. Uh, I wanted to, you know, you use the word alienation, you know, yes. in this, as to this is natural and not to be alienated inheritance. <clears throat> Dickens has already alluded to the American Revolution and, um, you know, yeah. um, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable rights. Um, are, are the only thing that people in the fallen world of uh, this novel have is their uh, dusty way toward death. That's their, that's their natural inheritance and it, it levels them all. Um, and I, I think it's, a, it's something of an ironic reflection on both the slogans of the French Revolution and of the American one. Oh, yeah, give me liberty or give me death. Well, you're not going to get liberty. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. Then uh, some critical work has focused on characters in the novel who try to overcome their alienation, some in a sinister way, like Madame Defarge by denying the individuality of her victims and associating herself exclusively with the Jacquerie, the revolutionaries. And in this mindset, it becomes possible to kill people if necessary to protect the revolution. Of course, that was the theory behind the, the reign of terror. But on the other hand, there could be a benign example of this attempt to overcome alienation. And that is Jarvis Lorry. Mm -hmm. And the somewhat lengthy description of Telson's bank. And someone has pointed out the importance of that name, Telson. Because Jarvis, although he's comical, gets a large part of his identity, his sense of importance from his job there at the bank. And so he could be seen as a benign response to uh, this threat of alienation, aloneness. Wait, I'm sorry, yes. I, I, I love John Vers Larry. I just don't know what you're saying here. How is he responding to the threat of alienation? Well, not responding, con uh, yeah, that's misleading. I, he's not doing it consciously, but his role at Telson's gives him a sense of belonging. Yeah, so he does not really suffer the kind of urban uh, alienation that Dickens describes. Is that any better? <laughs> I, a little, but I mean, he can't. Oh, he's a sneaky guy, but he can't get inside anybody's head. No, that's true. <laughs> I, I hope we talk about how sneaky he is because his backstory starts really coming across after a while. Uh, in fact, he, he's, he's so good at keeping a secret. I really got to envy him. If he didn't have that, that uh, barrier around himself, his own little temple bar, uh, it, it'd be a very different story. But I got to stop talking. I, mean, I just get carried away about some of these characters. <laughs> well, Jarvis Laurie is something that uh, dramatists and actors call fifth business. Fifth business is a character, not always a male, who makes everything work usually not involved in the romantic plot or a love plot. But as you know, Jarvis 
takes the baby Lucy across the channel and looks out for her. And then it was his, his role as banker that probably connected him to Dr. Manette in the first place. Um, can I, uh, I, I mean, I theorize and, and I can't, I can't help but think that, uh, of, you know, there are a million other people theorizing the same thing. Uh, I, I'm a believer in zeitgeist that, uh, uh, that Mr. Laurie was keeping the family afloat, uh, in sneaky ways, uh, via the, his role as fiduciary, uh, even before the doctor got to jail. Um, you know, and especially after, uh, and he, he just made sure every, everyone was taken care of and, and he didn't say anything. You, you never find out, even the doctor, you have to wonder if the doctor ever figured it out. Uh, you don't buy it, do you? Yes, I, I think you're right. Uh, we have to wonder where the money came from after Manette was imprisoned for 18 years. It I think we could go to the there... next slide, Courtney. I'm sorry. No, I'm just saying it sounds as if the, there was money in England as well as in France, and he would be using the money banked in England to support us. Yes, yes, very well, very well, well could be. I think we can go to the next slide, Courtney. Yes. Uh, while we're on Jarvis, I wanted to talk about something that Taylor Storr calls unnecessary detail. And it's curious because Taylor Storr eventually makes the case that it only appears unnecessary. In hindsight, we realize that it's necessary. Amen. And these images, figures of speech, if you will, show up in other passages. So this is a description of the furniture at the George Hotel in Dover. Laureate thinks he recognizes Lucy at first. The likeness passed away like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier glass behind her, on the frame of which a hospital procession of Negro cupids, several headless and all cripples, were offering black baskets of dead sea fruit to black divinities of the feminine gender and he made his formal bow to Miss Manette. Okay, so the inn has some dark old furniture elaborately carved. <laughs> but this is really the first, or rather the second uh, mention of a procession. The first one was the procession to which the French youth did not kneel, but we'll see, see other uh, processions later in the novel. And uh, I apologize for the 19th century language here. But anyone want to comment on the tone of this description? The tone? Tone? Uh, or the I mean, there's implications, so much in it. shall we say? Yeah. Of the implications? Hmm. I, I got stuff. I got stuff, but I do too much of the talking. It's all right. I, I think I think it's an indication that that um, that people don't survive love intact, and that uh, if if uh, Jarvis wants to really look at himself, he really loves the Minettes, even though he denies feelings. And there was another thing, but I forgot it already. So now I can be quiet. I'd be interested in a comment as to why such a, a gory, horrible description of the of the pier glass, the mirror, is is introduced when we first see Lucy. Yes, good question. Yes, 
a good question. Well, because her name really means helpful. light after all. <laughs> this is very dark. Mm. It's also an interesting use of the, um, using hospital as, a, as an adjective. Very interesting. Yes. But very gruesome and disturbing. I think this this aspect, the the light aspect of uh, of Jarvis is buried, and, and that's why, you know, in his own way, he needs to be recalled to life, like the candle life on mm -hmm. the mahogany, mm -hmm. and that's why it's dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I still want to know why the first time we see Lucy, who's the creature of light, we get that contrasting image of her reflection in this horrible mirror. I still say because it's Jarvis and Jarvis has that part repressed Be because it's through his eyes. Isn't there also a mention of a mirror in the uh, courtroom scene with Darnay? The same kind of... Um... Yes, there's a mirror above his head. Mm -hmm. With the same kind of darkness, I believe. Maybe Dickens is trying to give us some foreshadowing of what's to come. Oh, definitely. This is, this is pretty blunt. Yeah. Yeah, there are several sinister processions later in the novel. Can, can you tell us what, it, what the first few words, the likeness passed away. What is the oh, likeness? Sure referring to baby Lucy it's it's the likeness of of the Lucy. grown Lucy to baby Lucy hmm okay let's see it's on about the third page of chapter four and we have a long sentence as his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and a forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of lifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder or alarm, or merely a bright fixed attention, though it included all the four expressions. As his eyes rested on these things, a sudden vivid likeness passed before him of a child whom he had held in his arms on the passage across that very channel one cold time when the hail drifted heavily and the sea ran high, the likeness passed away like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier glass. So we're getting the, a little of the history of uh, Laurie and Lucy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, we can move to the next slide, Courtney, I think. I'm going to preface this by pointing out the very famous passage in the chapter entitled The Wine Shop. Someone's already mentioned this, I think. The first description of Defarge's wine shop when the cask of wine falls off the cart and breaks. It's fairly early in the novel. And the uh, description, of course, is a tour de force. And it was a, it was a great teaching tool to explain metaphor to kids. But at the end of the wine shop descriptions, about the second page of chapter one, uh, 
those who had been greedy with the way staves of the cask had acquitted, acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth. And one tall joker so besmirched his head more out of a long squalid bag of nightcap cap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine leaves. Blood. The time was to come when that wine too would be spilled on the street stones and when the stain of it would be read upon many there. <laughs> uh, now, needless to say, critics have said that that comment is pretty insulting. <laughs> uh, what do you agree that he could have cut that or left us to make the association? <laughs> I, 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 I figure that by and by as the book continues to speak to us, yes. uh, that that'll be revealed. It hasn't been revealed to me yet. Although that passage means so many things to me that you're gonna have to hit my off button if you open that up. Mm. Yeah, uh, the, I'm sorry about the quality of the scanned pages, but Taylor Storr's treatment of this passage is I think masterful. And the treatment of the, the wine shop description Now, I'm jumping ahead to the first trial of Charles Darney. I just want to look at the similarity of style here. Eager faces strained around pillars and corners. This is in the court of Old Bailey. To get a sight of him, spectators in back rows stood up, not to miss a hair of him. People on the floor of the court laid their hands on the shoulders of the people before them to help themselves at anybody's cost to a view of him. Stood a tiptoe, got upon ledges, stood upon next to nothing to see every inch of him. Now he's facing possibly a gruesome execution for treason. But it reminds me of the wine shop incident where Dickens goes and describes all the ways that people tried to soak up the wine, take advantage of it in great detail. In this case though, I, I think it's our first glance of the English mob or the potential for mob violence there. And uh, next slide, I guess, Courtney. Yeah, this is actually my last. On the left, we see Fizz's description of Darney at trial. I guess that's Striver in his legal wig looking at. No, up no, that's, up that's Courtney showing that's his legs. I'm sorry, who is it? It must be Cartney because it's headed the likeness. So it's showing the similarity between Cartney and Darney, the oh, two faces. Uh, right. uh, and I want to talk more about that incident. But it struck me that Fizz depicts the crowd here almost like a procession. And uh, the, the bottom illustration is actually of Sidney Carton uh, telling Lucy that he would serve her any way that he could. I included it to give you a somewhat better idea of the costumes of this time. Uh, fizz is good, but uh, we, we really often don't have a clear notion the effect of these costumes had.
I, I just wanted to, to mention something about uh, the, the picture on the right. I think this is yet another example of Lucy breaking through somebody's darkness. Yes, yes. It's a remarkable scene. It's, I think it's in our next reading uh, between her and Carton later on. Yes. Now, I, I want to look at towards the end of our reading today at the discussion between Striver and Carton. It's near the end of book two, chapter five. Does everyone understand what Carton does for Striver? Yes. Oh, yeah. He manages to to throw a doubt in the in the jury's uh, uh, impression oh, okay. yes. by yes. showing that uh, it, he could be mistaken for Darnley, so that they, this witness could easily have mistaken yes. Darnley. I'm glad you brought that up because I've read some critics who kind of sneer at this uh, moment when the witness can no longer be sure that he saw Darnley. What was it? Taking yeah. or handing papers to the French. I think that's so important because that's what when I and I think it must be because, as you said, you're getting Jerry's point of view. When I ended the the, the trial, I couldn't understand why they acquitted him, because we were getting all the evidence from such a biased point of view and no suggestion that the jury would be able to take a different view from the yes. one being demanded by the judge. But and the only evidence, the other way that was actually mentioned was the identification of, the, of how Sidney Carton looked so similar to Darnay uh, when they actually looked at the two faces close together. They looked so alike, yeah. and of course that's really important for later in the story. Most years, because I taught this in ninth grade, in most classes I had two ninth grade boys who looked very much alike. And so I'd get them to stand in front of the class back to back <laughs> and ask them, now, do you think it's possible for the witness to be confused by this likeness, especially because they're, they're young men that have a lot of character in their faces yet. And then a, a second consideration is that there is quite a bit of evidence that witness identification or a, Identification on lineups is unreliable. That a number of persons have been convicted based on eyewitness evidence that has turned out to be completely false. Uh, so I, I agree this happens very swiftly in the trial, but I find it uh, entirely realistic. It was also dramatic. It really kept us into the story. Yes, yes. And, and yet it, it's kind of surreal when Stryfer says, what an interesting thing you thought of. How, how did that ever occur to you? <laughs> well, actually in my later years of teaching, I inevitably had a boy who reminded me of a boy I taught 20 years ago often no relation but it was getting hard to remember names because of the striking similarity sometimes <laughs> i wanted to look at consider the work that carton does for striver anyone want to explain exactly what oh he does all carton? his research and pre prepares all his cases for him yes i yeah, okay. I, I think, uh, I cannot uh, say explicitly, but there is a paragraph where he describe, uh, Mr. describes Mr. Stryver 
as an attorney, even yes, though he yes. is very, very successful, he says something about him not being focused, not being able to pay attention to details about Mr. Striver. And in chapter five, when they show them uh, working together, Mr. Carton, even though he drank so much before and he's late, he comes at 10.15 p.m., but he show me, they show Mr. Carton's a face very focused on the work. So I was thinking, and he did some work for him, which they reviewed later on together. So I was thinking that he, he was good at working at the details. He was better than Striver at working yes. at the details. Yes. Uh, I got the impression he was the real power there. Striver could not have succeeded without him. He might have been able to succeed without Striver if he could have hit, got rid of his drink problem. Yes. And he yes. was a detective. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, later on, Carton will tell Lucy that he really can't overcome his addiction. Not in so many words. But yeah. Carton does all the tedious legal homework for Strider. Yeah. Yeah. Quite remarkable. Yeah. He's, he's I, the best lawyer in the world. Well, yes. my, high school, my high school English teacher said he was because he was <laughs> the best lawyer in uh, London and London was like the seat of the Magna Carta. Yeah, I mean, you get the impression that all the things that Striver is trying to show is faulty in the in the prosecution are coming straight from what he's been told by Carter's research beforehand. And then the, the, the final you know, one that works is when Carter suddenly notices this, the possibility of showing that there could have been a misidentification by the spy. Yes, yes. That whole comedy like, routine was Carter's material. Mm. What was uh, when they sit when they sit during the trial? They describe uh, Mr. Carlton looking at the ceiling all the time. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I so I was thinking if this had a purpose, and maybe uh, it had a purpose. Maybe if people saw his face, they'll get used to the detail, and they won't see the similarity. You know, if they they stood there for hours, so if they saw his face during those hours, they maybe it would affect it the way they see similarity. And if they just see it suddenly, I yeah. don't. I didn't get that impression simply because he had to pass a message to Striver to tell him to draw attention to the similarity between the two of them. So it looks like that was an impromptu something that came up during the trial rather than something that he'd planned beforehand. I had a totally different interpretation of ceilings. I, I thought it was people trying to look to the other world, but the ceiling was blocking it out. <laughs> no. no. But they say it only about Mr. Carton looking at the ceiling. He's the only one. So far. Yeah, so far. Or it could simply be showing his contempt for the people around him. Uh, that he can more easily, he just listens, he focuses on the ceiling and listens so he doesn't have to look at all these stupid people around him. <laughs> yeah. That sounds wrong. Well, I think the yes. ceiling, the, the roof ceiling trope comes into the courtroom uh, at least, well, a couple more times, well, with the mirror, but also I think that when, when Carton is depicted um, approaching Darnay and he's like, three or four feet below him. Um, I, I think that channels something um, in the Bible, if I'm not mistaken, that which disclaimer always goes when I speak of God or things biblical, because I don't have my Bible right open. But it seems to me that there's a thing where there's a centurion who says, uh, Lord, I'm, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Uh, and, and there's, and it looks like when when Carton approaches Darnay, it's like he's approaching under his roof. And maybe it's reading too much into the ceiling stuff, but I get one of the tropes that really gets to me when I look at two cities is the roof, the ceiling, 
stuff like that. Okay, uh, you have a, an expression on your face like that didn't really fit in, but I never know. Mm -hmm. I'll take a step back. Problem is my battery's running low. That's what I'm <laughs> going to have to plug in here. Yeah. Larry? Yeah, um, getting back to the subject of uh, of Carton looking like Darnay. Um, 1859 was also the year of the publication of uh, Wilkie Collins's book, Woman in White. And one of the um, key events in Woman in White is the establishment of the identity of our heroine after she has been um, declared dead. And um, I remember when I read that, being very impressed with the difficulty that they must have had in that time uh, establishing uh, identity if you didn't have uh, witnesses, maybe even if you did have witnesses. Uh, you had no fingerprints. That was that wouldn't come about for about another row, about 40 years, 40, 50 years. Uh, photography, uh, I don't think photography pretty much existed then, or if it did, it, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, something that people could use to establish identity. Because uh, not everybody uh, was commonly photographed. So perhaps uh, Wilkie Collins and Dickens being such good friends, Dickens may have had in mind the same thing that uh, issue that Wilkie Collins brought up in his book, published the same year as um, Tale of Two Cities. All right, I'm, I'm done talking here. I think I've over talked. <laughs> Wayne, I, I had put you on mute, so be sure to unmute. Okay, I'm, I'm good. I wanted to spend a little more time with this scene between Carton and Striver. Yeah. It's rather surprising. It's near the end of chapter five, book two, chapter five. And I think often overlooked. Upon my soul, I'm not sure that it was not yours. You were always driving and driving and shouldering and pressing to that restless degree that I had no chance from my life but to rust and uh, repose. It's a gloomy thing, however, to talk about one's own past with the day breaking. Turn me in some other direction before I go. That's uh, Carton speaking. Well then, pledge me to the pretty witness, said Striver, holding up his glass. Are you turned in a pleasant direction? Apparently not, for he became gloomy again. Pretty witness, he muttered, looking down into his glass. I have had enough of witnesses today and tonight. Who's your pretty witness? The picturesque doctor's daughter, Miss Manette. She pretty? Is she not? No. Why, man alive, she was the admiration of the whole court. Wrought the admi admiration of the whole court. Who made the old Bailey a judge of beauty? She was a golden haired doll. 
Do you know Sidney? said Mr. Triver, looking at him with sharp eyes and slowly drawing a hand across his florid face. Do you know I rather thought at the time that you sympathized with the golden-haired doll and were quick to see what happened to the golden-haired doll. Quick to see what happened? If a girl, doll or no doll, swoons within a yard or two of a man's nose, he can see it without a perspective glass. I pledge you, but I deny the beauty, and now I'll have no more drink. I'll get to bed. So what do you think is the reason that Carton, at this point anyway, belittles Lucy? He doesn't want to uh, acknowledge his own feelings. Mm -hmm. Very likely, yes. And he also wants to protect Lucy from Striver. He doesn't want to have Striver knowing anything of what he thinks about Lucy. Maybe he's protecting the barrier between himself and Striver at the moment. Mm. I, at least one critic has maintained that Carton Carton's psychology is such that he doesn't partake of the game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really want to compete, although he could, because he feels that it would compromise him in some way. It reminds me of a character in Hel uh, Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrib Scribner. Bartleby is a perplexing character because every time the boss asks him to do something, Bartleby says, I prefer not to. And <laughs> I think that's, at least according to this view, uh, Carton is willing to harm his own career by preferring not to, by staying out and not getting involved. But we really would like to know, I think, at the end, a lot more about Carton than we get in the novel. He's an intriguing character because so much is unspoken about him. Yes. Yeah, but it starts to come across subtextually. <laughs> like, like um, I think he's the one who pushed John Barsad down the steps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think that John Barsad cheated Sydney of, at cards and won his Cheshire estate. Because there isn't like a Carton estate up there in Cheshire. Okay, I, I was, when I, I got to the scene where they talk about uh, the beauty. Uh, what struck stru me was that up, up to that point, during the long trial, they don't talk about her beauty, they just talk about her compassion. And everybody is affected by her compassion. And this was so beautiful because you have the entire mob like ready for blood. And just, just this one single woman displaying compassion can affect an entire crowd. So, so I don't know, maybe that's how he wanted to see her. He didn't want to see her as a beautiful outside, but just as beautiful inside or something. Yeah, he does, he does mention um, her compassion. Uh, does he within this reading? That could be a spoiler, but that's what he likes. Yes, one could uh, say that he's like the shadow image of Darnie. Darnie is uh, 
good guy, Mr. Perfect, and Carton messes up as much as he can. <laughs> Not that doesn't mess with other people, but doesn't really take care of himself, to put it mildly. So he embodies everything that Darnie has suppressed in himself in order to be good as he is. And I wanted to ask you what you think about Darnie so far. Uh, people have found fault with Lucy being too sweet and too good, but they've also found fault with Darnie actually for the same reason, being too sweet and too good. Anyone He's want awesome. to weigh in on Darnie? He's awesome. He's totally awesome. He's, uh, he's, um, you know, Dickens um, researched these characters by, by putting on their shoes, which is kind of a spoiler too, but, you know, he, he wore their shoes all over the place and, and, and did and suffered it all. And these are very realistic characters for that reason. And I think if people are going to criticize the Darnays for, for um, that sort of thing, then uh, maybe it's because they're like, they're not that sweet. But, you know, D um, Dickens, uh, Dickens ascertained the reality, the, um, what do you call it? Um, reality, the realist, the realism of that. I, uh, what was? Go ahead. No, you can go ahead because, yeah. Well, the Darnies are such nice people, but Carton is so much more interesting. <laughs> yeah, flawed people are always more interesting than perfect people. <laughs> but what was interesting with Darnie, not only his goodness, but the the way he stood there and didn't look didn't look a, a void at all like he looked so stable like he's not afraid to die he's not afraid of what is coming to him right which he knew is almost certain and those descriptions were pretty amazing and we'll see a little bit later that Darnie does act heroically at least once absolutely I wanted to take a little time to discuss the quality of this novel, which is the relative absence of humor. Mm. Some of Dickens' humorous characters are perhaps uh, more memorable than the novel, like Sari Gamp, Martin Chuzzlewit, or Wilkins Micawber, and David Copperfield. At least when I think about no, some of those novels, the comical characters come immediately to mind. But what do you think happened here with uh, Jerry Cruncher, who I don't find to be all that funny? I thought the description of Telson's was hysterical. The way they described it, I particularly loved where if they should deign to hire a young person they hid him away like a <laughs> piece of cheese until he was aged appropriately yeah, right <laughs> and the way they wrote the checks and the flakes of old wood i thought that was very hysterical yes. <laughs> that whole description and his prejudice with his wife's uh, praying yeah. yeah flopping his fl flopping yeah <laughs> yeah flopping again me <laughs> and his relationship with his son was interesting yeah mm -hmm. I, I like the courtroom humor the, the questions put to uh, I think it was Barsad what is missing is dialogue but I gathered Dickens was interested in writing a true historical novel and decided to leave out as much dialogue as he had put in his 
other works. Yes, I agree. I think that's very good. It strikes me some of those great comical characters like Sari Gant and Wilkins Macabre are talkers. They are very voluble and funny when they are. <laughs> but you're, I think that is a problem for Dickens. He can't give Stryver too much space or he'll drop the ball, so to speak, with the narrative. Dickens complained to Forster about getting started, but he also complained about having to condense uh, his technique into these weekly issues, uh -huh. how to bring the story to a suspense point every week. So I think he managed, but he may have been circumscribed in some ways, one of them being humor. Nevertheless, it was a successful novel mm -hmm. when it was first published. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Wayne, over the, the, the three decades that you taught this novel, how was it received differently um, over the years um, by your students? Well, I was old fashioned and I thought, you know, ninth graders have read this for decades, maybe a century, and they should read it, but it was pretty tough for them. I had the most success working with specific passages like the wine shop passage, uh -huh. or later on, we'll get to it next week, the burning of the saint Avrimont Chateau but descriptions of that and uh, students could relate to that. So I don't know if one could simply take them out of context and try to give them a sense of that style and marvelous description because for kids who are used to 15 minute sound bites on television or shorter than that on the internet, I only asked them to read 15 pages for an assignment, but they found it very hard. Did you have students returning, Wayne, who may have thought it might have been torture, but how glad they were <laughs> to, and not because of you, but yes. who were so glad that they had that information in their hard drive? Well, let me think for a minute. I found out I never knew which students were getting something out of the class mm -hmm. because if they came back later and told me, I, it was always come as a surprise. <laughs> what do you mean, you? <laughs> I don't think anyone, oh, I remember sometimes they were blown away when they finished the novel, when Sidney Carton dies. They didn't see that coming and they hadn't read Sparks Notes or Cliff Notes. So <laughs> that was the biggest impact <laughs> I ever had. <laughs> I can't believe the way this novel ends. <laughs> Packed a punch. Yes. It was very much over my head in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I thought it was a spy thriller. I, I found ancient inscriptions in my book. Aha, so he's the spy, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I would wonder whether, it, it, and did you ever try this, whether, for example, playing the movie version of the book before they start reading would actually mm -hmm. help the students to, to appreciate right. the book better? So yes. they already have the narrative framework and the characters. Yes, involved. indeed. Yes. I almost included, on, included it on the reading list. There's a wonderful essay on the 1935 movie starring Ronald Coleman as Sidney Carton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
how that movie was really made in the midst of the depression and uh, revised somewhat to make it very timely. So yes, I actually, I never did that and that would have probably been a good idea. I worked I with remember. the people. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's all right. Go ahead. When I was younger, I would read the book and then look forward to seeing the movie afterwards. It was mm -hmm. like a treat. But I work with a speech therapist whose kids had some learning dis disabilities, and she would play the movie first. So, mm -hmm. as Irene said, so they had some sort of framework and then read it. So I was, I thought that was interesting because it, you know, wasn't yeah. how I had done it. I will say that I always found time to show the 1935 version of the standoff, and this gets to the end, standoff between Miss Pross and Madame Defarge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's the only movie version which basically imita imitated the barroom brawl scenes only with two women. <laughs> it is hilarious, wonderful. <laughs> but uh, other movies give us a much more staid confrontation. <laughs> There's no wrestling and falling on a table and then the floor that kind of thing. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Wayne, there's a, a, a question in the chat. Um, uh, Kendall asks, would you share the title and the author of the essay on the, the Coleman movie? You... I certainly will. Yeah, okay. I can get that out. Yeah. Oh, it's on my other batch of notes. Could I just send it to you and pass it on? Of course. Yeah. Well, have we missed anything that interests anybody? Perplexes. Uh, could I come back to my point as what yes. what do people think was was that that uh, persuaded the jury that Darnley was innocent? Because as I say, when I came to the end of that chapter, I mean it's not the first time I've read the book, but this was the first time it struck me that at the end of the the scene where the jury have gone off and and have come back with the unexpected verdict, I didn't know after rereading that chapter and the evidence presented why they had the jury had been able to see the truth of the situation. Striver had pointed out the uh, failings of two of the witnesses against Darnay. So the they judge, are... the judge was poo pooing the evidence. Did judges not have the influence on the jury then that they would have now? Well, I think it's a matter of introducing doubt mm -hmm. to the jury. Uh, and people on juries to this day will say the same thing. Uh, when we couldn't be absolutely sure of the identification, we voted to acquit, you know, mm -hmm. or some, sometimes called a reasonable doubt. Yeah, that, that's true, but you know what I wondered? So they introduced reasonable doubt, but there was no cross-examination at all after it was introduced, which to me was strange. Because remember when Laurie gave his testimony and he, say, he, he said, uh, the prosecutor tried to say that one of the passengers in the mail train was him. And he said, no, they were all covered. They were all covered. They couldn't even see their faces. And the prosecutor said, so are you admitting that they could have been him if you did see the faces? He really, it sounded to me like the OJ uh, trial. Like he was so uh, uh, sleazy with him. 
So I was surprised that after the new evidence came in, we didn't see any cross-examination. Mm -hmm. Blair, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, a question for Wayne. Wayne, in your, all right, just to explain, I am half French extraction, half English. And when I read Tale of Two Cities, I'm of two minds and wonder to what extent do you think uh, uh, Dickens was writing to the home crowd in some of his more criticizing paragraphs about the French? Or am I just reading too much into it and being sensitive as a half Frenchman? Well, when it first came out, Dickens was criticized for, let's say, some distortion in presenting the Marquis saint Agremont as somehow representative of the nobility, who had already uh, attempted some reforms. And uh, the Dickens represents some other customs as being still practiced, which in fact, by that, by 1775, were not like the droit de signeur. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, I, to answer your question, I think there is a little bit of bias, but as in the scene I read you from the Old Bailey, and then uh, there's a later scene involving an English profession. Uh, Dickens does give the English some, some hits in terms of being subject to mob violence. So Martha, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, I felt that Dickens had, was really criticizing the French and there, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't write it down, but there was one sentence that really I thought was really bold for him to say. And I was wondering whether he was criticized for it when he, when he wrote it. Um, I have some French cousin, distant French cousins and I've asked them whether they were familiar with Dickens and, and read them and none of them had ever read Dickens. Interesting. Even though uh, one of them is a tr real Anglophile and even calls his mother mum. Um, so, um, huh. but when it came to Dickens, I just, I guess they just don't read it in their school system. Mm -hmm. Irene? Uh, my question was about the reference to the French, to the American Revolution and kind of was to Washington or to the revolution itself. Uh, but what was the reaction, what was supposed to be the reaction of the, the English people to that in the courtroom? I was unclear whether they were, ex you know, whether they were horrified as the, the judge was, uh, uh, you know, sort of that, uh, uh, that, it, that such a revolution should be happening, that the war should be happening. Was this a, would the, would the people listening in the courtroom and the jury in particular be affected by this re reference to uh, you know, sort of the idea of, of challenging and, and, and supporting what was happening in, in America. Well, yes, if trial takes place in 1780, one year before, I guess, the fighting actually stopped. I think the Peace of Paris was 1783. So the American Revolution had not really quite ended when Charles is tried and I would guess that supposedly increased the suspicion against him mm -hmm. yes because as you know the French were helping the Americans the American colonies so to speak well yes in that case would that again not go strongly with the jury the, uh, against him as I say I saw so much evidence against him in that trial yes and not much sign of why in such a short time the jury turned around and acquitted him. I wanted a clearer idea as I read yeah. what, why that was happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a sudden reversal, all right. 
uh, no, I, I guess I wouldn't rule out the possibility that Dickens had run out of space. <laughs> That's a cheap answer. Right, right. right. <laughs> For practical reasons, oh, I've got to end it here. Darnie's freed. <laughs> Well, you know what? the the whole The whole plot would it, it had to go this way, or the whole plot would not have happened. <laughs> yeah. So we just tried to do some things that people weren't used to. I suppose, Joe I'm used to the idea that you build up to it by showing things happening in the courtroom that show that there's a possibility of an acquittal. It just seemed right. very sudden. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, they had some type of uh, uh, lectures or book club uh, at Stanford, and I just looked at their archives, and they say that this case is based on a real case, according mm -hmm. to one of the researchers, and mm -hmm. in the real case, he, he was uh, guilty. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dickens, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. That's excellent. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's why it's a tale of two cities. <laughs> uh -huh. Definitely entertainment was first and foremost, I think. It's also interesting that he alludes to the fact that he did transfer letters between London and Paris, right? But he couldn't disclose it because it was some family thing that, and he needed to protect his family. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that the court couldn't make him disclose what he did it for before they acquitted him or something. I didn't pick that up. That's Darnie, is that right? Yeah, yeah Darnie. He, he, he did, he did uh, transfer letters between uh, London and Paris. Yes but, yes. but they say he did it for some family business. That yes, he that's could right. Yes. And uh, it was curious to me that this type of court didn't try to disclose it, at least before they quit him because they were so powerful in getting out information. Yes. <laughs> and of course, Dickens is interested in setting up the climax of the novel, yeah. which relies upon the resemblance between Darnie and Carton. Yeah. I'm happy to say that in looking at the literature, A Tale of Two Cities has come back into favor. There was a time when it was considered almost second rate, but uh, too short and neither a satisfactory historical novel uh, nor any other kind of novel. But from what I have looked at, it is uh, now respected. It is good not respected or respected? It is respected now. Okay. Yeah. I think so I, I read where it passed in England as being one of the top 50 or the top 100 novels of all time in England. Great. It's oh, still wow. selling thousands and thousands and thousands of copies. And I think that's true here also. And I think it has influenced the British view of the French Revolution more than it has influenced the American view of the French Revolution. I have noticed since I came here a much more favorable view of the French Revolution than I was brought up with in my 60 <laughs> years in Britain. <laughs> uh -huh. I heard in one podcast that the host said that if you want a novel that teaches you about the period, he thinks War and Peace is a better one, just from the historical perspective. Do you have any comments on that? I don't know. I'm sorry, which novel did you mention? War and Peace. War and Peace? Yeah, War and Peace, Tolstoy. Yeah. Oh, War and Peace. Oh, yes. Okay. Tolstoy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if it's true or not true, but he said that 
from the period's point of view, he thought that war and peace is better. We'll have to do that next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <be> nice. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we're getting towards the end here. Is it five, seven minutes or something? So Wayne, as we're reading the, the next set of chapters for our May meeting. Is there anything that you would like to keep up? Is there anything that we should keep in mind? Or are there any articles of the ones that you shared that you think would be beneficial to, to read as we're reading these middle chapters? I think, let's see. I think they're about all equally apropos for the middle section. Yes, there's a little more actual history in the middle section as the French Revolution begins. So any background reading on that, I think would be helpful. Oh, it's interesting to get insights for example, on about Marie, poor Marie Antoinette, mm -hmm. who was sort of the crooked Hillary of her own day. Mm -hmm. And the nobility unwisely took part in vilifying her, thinking that it would be a way to curb the power of the king or the crown, but it's, it really undermined their power as well, uh, the aristocratic status. I don't know if th there's no anecdote like this in the novel, but when the crowd of women marched on Versailles, this was before the taking of the Bastille, the crowd of women marched on Versailles, which is a historical episode I love the poor guards couldn't bring themselves to fire upon or in any way resist the women so they they got into the palace without with little trouble and Marie Antoinette fortunately was able to flee from her bedroom through a secret servant's passageway and get to the king's room that way so I'll, I'll tell you just one more boring story about Marie Antoinette is as the women were getting towards the end of the march, they wanted the king greeted them from the balcony at Versailles. And then they asked to see Marie Antoinette. So she came out with her two children and the women wanted her to send the children back inside and some of the women were armed. So Lafayette was there and he knelt down in front of Marie to kiss her hand, but very possibly saved her life because they did not, did not fire with Lafayette there sort of in the line of sight. <laughs> mm. But, <laughs> Yeah, the crooked Hillary of her day. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of the feeling against Marie Antoinette was because she was Austrian. Oh, yes. And oh, yeah, the French yeah. and the Austrians had fought several wars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the Austrian queen, the foreign queen. The foreign queen. Well, I'll uh, get started on the central section. And uh, anybody has any suggestions for the central section, I'd be happy to incorporate them. Okay, thank you all very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Good job, Wayne. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it's good to see you, even if remotely. <laughs> Thank you. And everyone. Good job, Wayne. Good job. Thanks. Thanks.